Welcome back to Beaconsfield Podcast, everyone. It's my great delight today to be speaking with someone who's been an enormous influence on my own thinking about Mahatma Gandhi and Indian history and the history of political thought and moral action more broadly. And that's Professor Faisal Devji. Uh, Faisal is Professor of Indian History at St. Anthony's College in Oxford. He's the author of several books, and the one which draws us to this conversation today is The Impossible Indian. Gandhi and the Temptation of Violence. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Faisal. Thank you for having me. Uh, Faisal, one of the things that first strikes we want about reading your book on Gandhi is that the standard portrait of the saint, um, which most of us are familiar with and think when thinking about Gandhi, almost seems to disappear entirely from view immediately. What instead we confront is a figure who is associated with, obsessed with, violence and the radical possibilities of violence leading to non-violence. I thought we might start with what you think Gandhi's relationship to violence was in both moral and historical terms, and we might jump off from there. Yes, well, that's a big question, obviously, uh, but it is the question uh, for Gandhi. Uh, and as I try to argue in the book, um, rather than seeing him as someone who wants to flee from violence or uh, shut it off somehow, almost a kind of Buddhistic way of thinking, uh, Gandhi is drawn to it by a tremendous attraction almost, one can, almost, one can say. Uh, not because he finds it desirable, but because he sees its importance in every aspect of life. Mm. Uh, so he repeatedly tells us that it is impossible to actually get rid of violence, that life is made up of violence, mm. uh, whether it is giving birth or eating or any other form of living, uh, all of it involves violence of some kind. Now, there's something quite Jane-like, of course, about this, uh, this statement, uh, but he pushes it further uh, in saying that rather than uh, in the way that a Jain might do or a Buddhist might do, trying to uh, leave it aside uh, or escape from it in some way, what we need to do is actually engage it more fulsomely to understand its nature mm -hmm. and to, as it were, negate its effects. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think he's concerned not with the, not so much with the presence of violence, which is inevitable, but with the way in which we might be able to prevent its perpetuation. That's where human agency comes in to the picture in, in, in a way. Um, that we might not be responsible for all violence, but we are responsible for perpetuating it or for doing the opposite. Uh, uh, cauterizing it, he often uses that term in English. Uh, and this is what his work is about. So in order to do that, you need to actually get close up to violence. You need to understand it almost from the inside and see it in yourself, not simply in the other. Um, now, how do you cauterize violence? Uh, how do you stymie it? How do you prevent its perpetuation? Uh, that then gets to be, if you will, Gandhi's mission uh, in life. Uh, now, he understands that violence and nonviolence are intertwined and entangled with each other, um, uh, such that it would be impossible to pull them entirely apart. Mm -hmm. But your attitude towards violence is what, um, uh, if you will, converts it uh, into its opposite. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and indeed, when you think about his terminology, Nonviolence, like many of Gandhi's terms and categories, is a negative one. Uh, it begins both in Sanskrit, ahimsa, uh, and in English, nonviolence. Mm. Uh, and it's negative because, of course, he thinks violence is the truly pos positive category. Mm. Uh, uh, nonviolence, as it were, presumes the existence of violence. Mm. Uh, and its reality only emerges from what I'm calling the most intense engagement with it to convert it into its opposite. Um, 
And that conversion is only possible because violets and non-violets are deeply entangled uh, with one another. Um, so not to repeat myself, but uh, to say yet again, perhaps in other words, that struggling with violence is what uh, Gandhi does and what he counsels. And in that sense, he really departs Indic tradition. Uh, it's not uh, some kind of recension of, you know, Eastern spiritual wisdom yeah. or the legacy of Buddhism or Jainism. There's something quite novel going on here. And that's the kind of thing that is of interest to me. Yes. And, and I mean, you wrote an article initially called, I think, Morality in the Shadow of Politics when thinking about Gandhi. And it's interesting that Gandhi roots his space for ethical thinking in the Gita, right, on the battlefield. He's concerned with what it means to be ethical in the midst of action, to understand oneself like Arjuna as being on a battlefield in which violence and suffering are implicit in the situation, uh, where we are all, you know, bound up with violence just by our very virtue of being human. It, it, it seems, Faisal, that, and this, I've, I've, I've come to this by speaking also to Uday Mehta at times, that what Gandhi is concerned about with violence is its capacity to take us out of ourselves, to take us out of our sense of being implicated in a situation where we are impure, where we are imperfect, by providing us with this false sense of destiny that makes us think we can assert ourselves perfectly on the world through that violence. And so he's worried in that sense about self-deception and about what it does to our integrity. Is that is that a right reading of the way that Gandhi thinks about the relationship between moral integrity on the battlefield and why one needs to give up violence or choose the negative aspect of it, which is nonviolence? Yes, there is certainly that. Um, uh, and that's certainly one way of looking at the situation. Uh, but there are others as well. So um, in a way, personal integrity is not the right term for mm. what Gandhi wants. After all, here is a man who repeatedly says he wants to destroy the ego who wants to reduce the self to nothingness, to ashes and cinders. Uh, uh, this is not the liberal self or the individual, uh, which requires integrity and, if you will, building up and solidification. Uh, on the contrary, it needs to be ripped apart, opened up, uh, and left vulnerable to experience of various kinds. Um, and to be, as I said, reduced to nothingness, to dust, Gandhi often says. Mm. So that doesn't seem, those words don't seem to me <clears throat> to be ways of thinking about personal integrity. Yeah, yeah. Or, if you will, um, self-building and self-protection. Yeah. Uh, there's something else going on. There's a, um, in, in a way, the self needs to be torn apart to be rendered open to the other. Uh, not only to the other who is one's potential enemy, but of course, to the transcendental other, uh, which he calls God, uh, that is also truth. And then truth is unavailable in any other way, but through the renting of the self, uh, the, the tearing apart of the ego. Mm. Uh, and it's only in this way that the self actually comes to recognize what it shares with others. Right. Um, you know, and if you look, if you're returning back to the battlefield of the Gita, uh, you can see what he means when he argues that um, evil and goodness are interconnected, as I was just saying, in response to your first question, mm. in such a way that virtue subtends evil as much as it does goodness. Mm. Uh, right? So uh, the fact that the evil army of Duryodhana even holds together is due to the fact that his soldiers are animated by virtues, indubitable virtues, mm. like courage, like bravery, like compassion for their fellow soldiers, mm. uh, like the ability to sacrifice. Uh, no army holds together because of fear, fear of generals or fear of its leader or merely because of fanaticism uh, or because they are paid or because of the hope for victory. It can only hold together in Gandhi's view uh, because of these very elementary and everyday virtues that bind individuals with one another. Mm. 
Duryodhana himself doesn't really control that, though he might benefit from it. <clears throat> the responsibility, therefore, is of the soldiers <clears throat> more than it is of his own. And what needs to be done is for these soldiers to withdraw their cooperation from the evil that Duryodhana represents by withdrawing their virtue from it. And withdrawing virtue from it, of course, means that evil collapses. Uh, so here you have a situation in which the virtue that defines solidarity and selfhood mm. is nevertheless in the keeping of evil and can is, has been given over to evil. Mm. Uh, and what is required is the withdrawal yes. of that virtue. So when you think in these terms, not only do you recognize, as I think Gandhi did, the intertwinement of good and evil, violence and nonviolence, but also that the virtuous self is something that um, in some ways is neither here nor there. That is to say the virtue of the self can exist in an evil form as well as in a good form mm. uh, because it is virtue that subtends both uh, in the end. Yes. So, And this puts into question the kind of project that would see in Gandhi um, uh, in, in Gandhi's views, the effort to create a virtuous uh, uh, ego or virtuous selfhood, uh, because that virtue can go in any direction. It's the withdrawal and the renting uh, and the tearing apart that actually is crucial. I, I see the language of personal integrity does not actually withdraw the good that is bound up with the evil in making that self that makes total sense and so nonviolence is the withdrawal of the good um from that which is supporting evil in the world you you, you write about gandhi's experiments with violence and you make this very interesting and subtle and i think original point which is to say gandhi's not actually interested in political independence for india he's actually not interested in the political project or the work here what he is trying to do is use india as a site for nonviolence, to withdraw good from supporting evil, so as to set a precedent for the rest of the world. There's a kind of global mission underlying his uh, his project of nonviolence. C could you expand on that a little bit here for our listeners? Yes, I mean, I think he's, um, of course, Gandhi is the great hero of Indian nationalism. There's no gain saying that. Mm. On the other hand, when you look at what he himself said, he has much more ambitious uh, visions for nonviolence. First of all, nonviolence is nothing, there's nothing national about it. It's not peculiarly Indian in any way. Uh, you know, he, uh, for instance, in his book, Satyagraha in South Africa, he, Satyagraha is a truth force, is a term that he develops himself. It's a novel, it's a neologism in South Africa. And he sees as exemplary of Satyagraha the uh, fasting and the the sacrifice, I should say, of Boer women, Afrikaner women in concentration camps during the Boer War. So there's nothing Indian about it at all, though it has a heavy duty Sanskritic name. Mm -hmm. um, uh, India is not special in that sense, though he does think that in the past Indian thinkers have attended to the question of nonviolence, perhaps uh, more intently than thinkers from any other part of the world. Nevertheless, he doesn't think that they had been successful politically ever. Uh, you know, he has a wonderfully interesting uh, correspondence with his good friend C.F. Andrews, in which Andrews tells Gandhi, ah, but India is the place. You know, this is where these experiments have been tried out. And Gandhi says, no, they haven't. They've not succeeded. And he, he points to uh, all kinds of things within Hinduism and outside it to show, no, we have actually endured the reign of violence, despite the thought of nonviolence that has animated so many Indian philosophers in the past. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing special about India in this sense, except that it is, if you will, the world's biggest colony. Uh, it is a populous place, and therefore it is an appropriate site for the making and the demonstration of nonviolence, mm. uh, which has been discovered outside India. It has been discovered in South Africa. Uh, and for Gandhi, what happens in India, therefore, serves as a precedent uh, 
uh, for nonviolence and for struggles of many kinds uh, around the world. Uh, in that way, he is Indian partisan as an Indian. He thinks India actually is meaningful in the world for this reason. Um, but otherwise, uh, you know, the experiment is uh, aptly named. He likes these terms, these scientific terms like experiment. Though, of course, in, in the title of his autobiography, which is translated as the story of my experiments, truth, the word experiment in the Gujarati's prayog, which is not exactly the same thing. Uh, nevertheless, what I think is experimental about Gandhi's approach is uh, it's not necessarily an experiment in doing. If you, if you see, uh, of course, the act of nonviolence itself is experimental, but there's a thought experiment that really, uh, and that precedes it mm. and that makes it what it is. And I think so much of Gandhi's uh, writing as his action is determined by these kinds of experiments in thinking. So what he seems to be saying on almost every occasion is, let's see what happens if I approach any particular situation and reverse, turn around all the usual ways of thinking about it. Mm. Uh, what would it look like then? Mm. Uh, I, I think that is the nature of the experiment that he's conducting. Mm. Uh, it's a mental experiment in some ways, and of course, a physical one in others. Uh, whereas if we actually completely turn around, turn this thing situation on its head, yeah. uh, what, might, what opportunities might it offer us? Yeah. Uh, in thinking about it differently, how might we act with regards to it differently. Mm. Um, I, I remember reading... And it's almost, you know, it's a, almost in many cases a deliberate effort to do that Hegelian thing, to turn something on its head. Yes, yes. The, the, I think there's a line in, in Louis Fisher's um, uh, profile on Gandhi, you know, in My Week with Gandhi, where he says, you know, Gandhi thinks aloud. Um, you know, and he's... I, I'm wondering, Faisal, if... Did that ever have disastrous consequences? Because he was a man with an enormous amount of public responsibility, um, a leader of a movement, um, even if he did not necessarily want to see himself that way, others did. Um, were there disastrous consequences to making decisions about action on the battlefield um, according to you know thought experiments that sought to transform the nature of politics um, by putting morality before politics? Yes, but were there consequences that ever went badly for Gandhi and, and for India? Yes, there were, and he acknowledges them. Mm. So, you know, his famous words, you know, a Himalayan blunder or Himalayan miscalculation, he uses this, <laughs> this term on more than one occasion. Uh, and of course, he punishes himself mm. uh, for it. Uh, the famous instances being during the non-cooperation movement yes. in the 1920s, when you have these policemen burned to death in their in their jailhouse have been locked in and uh, after which Gandhi abandons the movement altogether and goes on a fast and all the rest mm. um, uh, and there are other movements uh, like this which uh, uh, other instances like this which don't necessarily require the abandonment of the whole movement but Gandhi is very stern both with himself and others mm. uh, if someone has been killed uh, you know during a um, uh, a protest that has turned violent, uh, for instance. He blames himself. Now, you might say, well, this is easy enough for him to do. However genuine, he might feel that he uh, is to blame. Uh, in fact, he hasn't hesitated in carrying out such an experiment in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I suppose Gandhi's response might be that, yes, he bears the blame. Uh, at the same time, he has not coerced anyone mm -hmm. uh, into accompanying him in this experiment. Mm. Uh, and the whole point of a nonviolent protest is that it is persuasive, uh, persuasive both in terms of what Gandhi says about its benefits to get others to follow him, but also in what he himself does with his own body, mm. putting himself, his own body on the line 
uh, in, in another form of persuasion. Uh, so he will not ask of anyone what he does not do himself. Mm. Um, now that may or no may not justify the experiment mm. uh, as being non-coercive. Mm. Though, of course, others like the poet Tagore uh, didn't believe this and thought that Gandhi and the Gandhian movement actually was coercive in so many ways. Mm. And that there was no way in which it couldn't be so. Uh, mm. That all mass movements of this kind uh, were coercive in their nature, and then whatever it is that Gandhi said, uh, how people actually responded uh, to a movement uh, was not dependent on their, as it were, measured uh, understanding or evaluation uh, of it. Uh, so there's a way in which Tagore recognizes that the, the kind of liberal language of persuasion, which on occasion Gandhi seems to hold on to, uh, when justifying himself, uh, really has become meaningless in the realm of mass action. Mm -hmm. There does seem to be that tension, doesn't there, between his exemplary action and his consciousness about his exemplary action and those thought experiments which seem to go one way or the other, a way that he might not even be a, in control of. And that and that is, is what is interesting about Gandhi, but also frightening when you when you read him, I mean, to take a particular point, you know, Gandhi's relationship to the British Empire, that seems to me to also change over time and not necessarily in a linear way. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it goes back and forth. I think there are moments where he encourages the Indians to go and fight for the British in World War One because he wants them to understand what it means to die for freedom. Um, and, and that ties in with the notion of nonviolent good and, and, and violent action being bound. Um, on the question of Gandhi's relationship to the British Empire and liberalism, um, where did it sit at its centre? Did he believe in the language of liberal persuasion? Did he believe that India could belong to a Commonwealth um, within the British framework and still be India? Where, where did he sit with that? I know it's a hard question to say. Yeah, it's, it's difficult, but I agree with you that, you know, the usual perception is that Gandhi started off as a loyalist. Mm. Uh, and then abandoned loyalty to the empire uh, and become became, if you will, a nationalist. Mm. I don't see it quite like that. Um, I don't think there is that one central break, which people trace to the early 1920s, you know, during the first non-cooperation movement, especially after the Amritsar massacre, the Jallianwala Bag massacre, um, where General Dyer kills hundreds of unarmed Indians. Mm. Um, uh, but, you know, even after that, you see Gandhi demonstrating his loyalty and uh, maybe loyalty is not the right word. I think what's happening is there are two things. One is that he tries to get the best out of any, if you will, political or moral order. Interesting. Uh, uh, and he asks its upholders to test themselves by their own ideals. Uh, so, you know, whether it is Hindus and Muslims or Christians, mm. whether it is the British or the Nazis in Germany or whoever, um, he tells them all, I will take you at your word mm. uh, because I know that virtue subtends even evil. So I will, I will draw upon the virtues that subtend even your evil, assuming there is evil there. Mm. Uh, and ask you to be true to yourself. I'm not going to impose my ideals on you, mm. uh, but let me act in such a way as to oblige you mm. by your own argument to be true to yourself. There's something strangely Socratic about this, you know, where the question answer really forces uh, the interlocutor mm. to come to a more adequate consciousness of his or her own position. Uh, and in doing so, uh, remain faithful, this is the Gandhian gloss, mm. to it, uh, to him or herself. Mm. Uh, so I think he has this view of the empire as he does of any other country or any other community, etc. Mm. I don't think he differentiates. Uh, but he also thinks that the empire might be transformed internally. Mm. Uh, and one of the things that appeals to him about it it's exactly the same thing that Hannah Arendt, I argue uh, in my book, uh, does you know, many years later uh, with the British Empire, where she thinks, like Gandhi did earlier, that 
an imperial schema really allows, if it's democratic, mm. allows for the dissolution of the nationalist problematic of majority and minority in terms of social majority and social minority rather than the changing economic and other majorities and minorities that republics are supposed to be yeah. um, defined by, yeah. but rarely in fact are. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Gandhi, like Arendt, is interested in how an empire, because it's of its sheer scale and plurality, really disintegrates these notions of majority and minority uh, and of national identity as a given social identity. And in doing so actually makes both moral and political life possible uh, that in that sense, actually liberalism is more adequate to empire yeah. than it is to any kind of nation state. Mm. So, you know, Ode, Ode Mehta's wonderful book, of course, Liberalism and Empire, mm. poses the question of how all of these imperialists could have been liberals at the same time. Mm. I think Gandhi's response might have been to argue that the empire is the only political form in which liberalism is possible uh, because it is not, identity is not tied down to ethnicity, religion, class, caste, etc., because of its sheer scale and multiplicity. Mm. Uh, um, and therefore, liberal ideals in a, in a democratic or democratized empire uh, are at their truest. Uh, they wouldn't be true in any other situation. Right. Uh, so I think he's quite, you know, he's quite, he's, he's willing because he doesn't have an ideal political form mm. to recommend. Mm. He doesn't think that such a thing exists. Mm. Uh, he understands that perforce, you know, by the time you get to the 1940s, the nation state is the game in town and India has to be a nation state. That is a historical necessity. Yeah. Uh, but he doesn't otherwise think there is an ideal political form. He never mentions such a thing. Mm. Unlike political thinkers in the Western tradition, he doesn't, you know, try to build a vision of some such thing. Uh, and so the empire is a form among other forms. Mm. And if uh, uh, he were to be Burkean about it and say, well, you know, I'm not interested in a revolution, in a necessarily violent revolution mm. that will overthrow the social order, however evil, mm. uh, and in doing so only perpetuate its violence because any violence that seeks to undo another violence only perpetuates it. Mm. Uh, instead of doing that, let's see what we can make of this order. Yeah. Uh, how can we actually, by making it true to its own inner virtue, its own self, mm. transform it from the inside? And that was the great test, if you will, mm. for the British Empire, one which it signally failed. That's fascinating. I have so many questions. <laughs> That's a really exciting thought. It's, I mean, let's start with the idea. Is Gandhi some sort of conservative then or you know I've, David Bromwich uses the phrase conservationist when talking about Burke and perhaps that applies here too someone who is interested in preserving through internal reform any order which limits or reduces the possibilities of violence um, in order to allow for the moral transformation of politics is a Gandhi like a, a conservative revolutionary if you like as opposed to someone like Lenin or Trotsky or Stalin or Hitler <laughs> Yeah, you know, I've been thinking about this and uh, I tend to agree that um, uh, he is conservative, not necessarily because he sees inherent value mm. in existing customs, practices or behavior. Mm. So he's not quite like Burke in that respect, mm. uh, but because he thinks overthrowing such practices, etc., uh, would involve a kind of irreducible violence uh, that would then only perpetuate itself. Yeah. So in a way, the problem is how do you change something without the deployment of violence? Yeah. Uh, and in order to... In, in order to counsel nonviolence, mm. you don't have to presume the virtue of what exists. Mm. 
if you see what I mean. Uh, so, uh, of course, he does also talk about the virtue of what exists on many occasions, especially caste, uh, the issue of caste and caste hierarchy or intermarriage between religious groups. Mm. Uh, there are many such things that he tries, from which he tries to recover what I'm calling their inherent virtue because everything has an inherent virtue in it. Uh, but that is not to say that these things need to be preserved as it were for their own sake. Yeah. Uh, they simply exist because to cause them to fail or to remove them from the scene would involve a kind of revolutionary violence that is uncontrollable mm. uh, and whose end can never be nonviolent. Mm. So, you know, if it's conservatism, then it's a conservatism of a kind that is strangely, strangely for Gandhi, who often described himself as a gambler and as someone willing to take risks, very cautious. He's not so cautious about the self, about himself, mm. or the moral self in general. That he wants to tear apart and reduce to dust and all the rest. <laughs> so if you will, that's where the violence goes in some, it, it redounds to oneself. Mm. And that's one way it, in, in which it can be sublimated. He uses that word interestingly, mm. or cauterized or whatever, you know, where you turn it back to yourself. Mm. Um, you know, like the, the story of Shiva, <laughs> holding the poison in his throat, uh, you know, which is why he has a blue Nilkant, which is why he has the blue throat in depictions uh, of him, um, where you actually absorb it to yourself and you, you save yourself and that way you save the world. Uh, but what that says about the institutions of society that Gandhi doesn't want to revolutionize uh, remains, I think, really quite ambiguous. So yes, conservative, but not a romantic conservative. Yeah, uh, he's not romantic in the way that Burke might be. Yeah, because what it, you know, it's it's interesting the Burke Gandhi comparison. We we've spoken about this before, and I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, you know, Burke will never be as radical and as Gandhi in the sense that Burke is not interested only in moral transformation. He is interested in the stability of an order, um, of a social fabric, in the mm -hmm. continuity of a civilization, because he sees that continuity and stability as the foundation for moral preservation of the self. Um, but Gandhi, as you say, is not actually interested in personal integrity. He's interested in the transformation of, <laughs> of our entire reality into a moral mm. space. Um, one, one of the questions I have coming off, off that is, is this, you know, if Gandhi's adopting this persuasive tactic, if you like, of appealing to people's best instincts or ideals in order to expose how they have fallen so far away from them mm. and to change their behavior. Is that not a persuasive tactic that relies in some way upon personal integrity um, of the person that you're appealing to in order to change their view? Um, or is, or is he, is he approaching that rhetorical maneuver in a different way that I'm, I'm not seeing there? Um, integrity in that sense, yes, because let me approach this in a different, from a different direction, which is, mm. you know, one of the uh, most common criticisms of Gandhi, wherever it comes from, right, left, center, mm. is that of hypocrisy, that he was, an hip there was a hypocrite. Yeah. Uh, you know, he said one thing and he did another, or he didn't really believe in what he was saying. Mm. And what's really interesting about this accusation is, well, two things. One is that hypocrisy is, you know, what Schlar will call a minor vice, uh, so why it should be made into this major statement is itself uh, intriguing. But secondly, uh, I think it's interesting because his critics are unable or find it very difficult to draw a distinction between what Gandhi says and what he does. Uh, right? So they need to constantly search out the gap between what he says and what he does and are constantly therefore forced to look for hidden meanings, hidden scripts, et cetera. So in that sense, mm. personal integrity mm. is meaningful insofar as Gandhi disallows mm. 
the uh, depth of personality, which allows for, if you will, the mining of contradictions and gaps and all within it. So yes, there is integrity, but it is not necessarily based on the plenitude, richness, and depth of a personality and its complexity. Uh, So his moral persona is in some ways quite thin, deliberately so, I think. Mm. Um, Because it really is meant to demonstrate to itself and to others its faithfulness to its own ideals. Uh, and so it's a constant test that's occurring. Yeah. And for that test to occur, you need a kind of curiously flattened selfhood. That doesn't mean there are no depths in the sense that, you know, there's no deep thinking or no deep feeling or anything like that. But in the world of moral and political life, yeah. where which for Gandhi is such an ocularly defined world, You need to display yourself and see the other. And that's how the process of conversion occurs. It's through sight, not through sound. You know, I spoke of persuasion earlier. And of course, he speaks and he writes. But sight seems to be the most crucial sense for Gandhi. Uh, In fact, he prefers silence uh, because speech always betrays the self, Uh, whereas And it's also persuasive in the wrong sense because it wheedles uh, and it, 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 through rhetoric, it convinces on grounds that are aesthetic and emotional rather than moral and intellectual. Mm. And therefore the silent display Mm. of, if you will, faithfulness to oneself is what is required. Uh, And that silent display, of course, is often for Gandhi, a display of sacrifice and suffering. Mm. Uh, So uh, what kind of selfhood is this? Mm. Uh, Yes, it has integrity, certainly, uh, because it cannot be prized apart to show gaps, contradictions, uh, but also by the same token, therefore, complexity and richness. Mm. So it is a selfhood that is not of the romantic, uh, you know, 19th century kind, a a fullness of personhood. I don't think that is really what he's thinking about. Yes. So so, so, so Gandhi would be skeptical, Faisal, then of someone like Burke who thought that rhetoric could rearrange the moral and intellectual architecture of a human being. He he would think that there is a, that there is something, um, illusory about that endeavor that better it's to demonstrate through oneself and one's action and one's suffering what one Hmm. really means and really values would that would that be correct to say yes whether whether he's successful or not is another question because of course the 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 display of suffering has a rhetorical uh nature of its own um you know it doesn't need to say anything Hmm. uh which is perhaps why he also asks voters of nonviolence not to exaggerate their suffering or their pain and not to act so as to, as it were, display their wounds. You know, this is not what he's recommending. Mm. The figure of the everyday figure of the beggar who displays wounds, you know, or the martyr's wounds even. Mm. Uh, so he's not keen on that at all. Um, you know, to return to the Jalen Walabag massacre, he's of course horrified, uh, but he doesn't dwell on the horror of the situation uh you know that is an appeal to emotion that he's not keen on he's much more interested in what happens immediately after the massacre itself so he tends to think of the massacre as being an act of bravery and courage it is horrific but he sees the the those who have died as being martyrs in certain in a certain sense right. so they are they are heroized right. they're not seen as victims uh just as the nonviolent warrior is not ever to be seen as a victim but always as an agent therefore there's nothing to do with displaying of wounds and asking for pity mm. uh what he truly minds is the incident of the crawling lane that happens also in amritsar shortly after where the lane in which 
a, a, a lady missionary, Miss Sherwood, had been attacked, but also saved by Indians, uh, was rendered into this strange kind of field of battle almost where the Indians who had to pass through it had to crawl on their bellies um, and were whipped and all the rest. Uh, so to enter or exit that lane. And for Gandhi, this was far more horrific a situation, though no one was killed. Uh, it was horrific because he thought Indians willingly or voluntarily humiliated themselves mm. by crawling on their bed, that this was the worst possible thing. It was not life and death. It was the submission to humiliating conditions rather than resisting them. Uh, that would really tell upon the person, the personality. Uh, you know, in a way, it is that kind of experience of, humili of humiliation that makes for the the Burkean, let's say, person kind of personhood full of depth and sorrow and anguish, and uh, but also, of course, pleasure and joy and all the rest. Mm -hmm. And Gandhi is completely against that. Humiliation is the worst possible thing, whereas the death of people in Jalian Balabagh can be lauded as bravery. Uh, courage and mm. martyrdom mm. Uh, and does not call for pity. Uh, so there too, you know, the, the sight, the sense that Gandhi places, mo places most emphasis on uh, is not one in which being pitiable uh, is what counts. On the contrary, the display is always the display of agency, of moral agency. It's it's um that, that that's fascinating again. I mean, we were speaking just before this call about Simone Weil and you know her thinking about or thought about affliction, mm -hmm. and it seems that Gandhi thinks there is a state at which affliction can be authentic without rendering the afflicted a victim, um, mm -hmm. and and that is what she is seeking to hold on to. What does Gandhi then think of that kind of cavern of sorrow and of feeling that we have when we go through? when we undergo violence, even if we're facing it non-violently, does he think that diminishes us, you know, the depths of sorrow that you mentioned, or does he think that there's a place for that in human life, yet even in a, in a courageous human life? Yes, I mean, you can't escape sorrow, um, but for him, if you choose it, then it is your own. It is not something that has come to you accidentally or from the outside. It is not someone else's fault. Uh, it is something you are freely, insofar as, as you're free to choose uh, um, in, a, in a non-liberal or non-capitalist way, you have chosen. Um, you own it. Uh, so it may not be a pleasant experience, uh, but it is one that you must master and get through. So such are Gandhi's fasts unto death. You know, he has deliberately taken those on. Uh, and he has to work through them at the risk of his own life. Mm. Uh, and that makes them his own. Now, obviously, that's not the only way in which sorrow approaches us. We don't always choose it. Uh, but for Gandhi, somehow or other, you must end up, as it were, being its agent rather than its victim. Um, so, you know, the famous advice or the infamous advice that he gives, whether it's African-Americans or whether it is Jews in, in Nazi Germany, uh, you know, do not allow yourselves to be dragged away in the middle of the night. If you, can, if, if you can flee, flee. If you can fight, fight. If you can't do either, then your task is actually to die with self-respect and while dying, in the process of your own death, turning that process into an act of nonviolent, if you will, persuasion to convert your own enemy, uh, if not in this generation, in the next generation. Mm. In that way, there will be redemption because you will redeem your own descendants who will not be humiliated by your death. Mm. And you will redeem the descendants of the Nazis themselves. Uh, and you will face them with this test. Those very soldiers who are dragging you away, you will not allow yourself to be dragged away anonymously in the middle of the night. You will non-violently protest, mm. 
So all your neighbors will know what's happening and you will appeal by your courage to the Nazi soldiers themselves because you will have claimed to be the most, to be the truest of the Germans uh, because you will have demonstrated in yourselves the courage, bravery, et cetera, that they claim are properties of the German soul. Uh, so it's a difficult piece of advice to give anyone, but you see what's happening. Uh, the victim can never just be a victim, yeah. must always be an agent, a moral agent, yeah. and working not only for him or herself, but for the other mm. at the same time. Mm. Uh, and they may die, mm. uh, but their death will be redemptive mm. for everyone in the end. Mm. Now, this is advice that Gandhi gave as I said, all kinds of people. Um, he doesn't differentiate in terms of the scale of atrocity uh, that provides the context for suffering. Uh, he's completely against the adoption of a victim identity in every instance. Because mm -hmm. this, of course, gives rise to even more violence. Yeah. Uh, it gives rise to violence among onlookers who are horrified if you will, theatric by this piece of theater uh, and for whom it can only be a piece of theater insofar as they're not part of it. Um, and, and that is part of the horror of it, that they haven't been able to do anything about it. Mm. So it leads to retrospective revenge. It humiliates the descendants, the survivors and the descendants of those who have suffered. Mm. Uh, and in a way, like a Greek tragedy, it completely disallows the resolution. You know, somehow the Furies, uh, you know, nemesis must, must work itself out. <laughs> and for Gandhi, that is just not adequate. Mm. Uh, you know, it can be dealt with and should be dealt with mm. uh, in the present. Mm. Yet, yet again, you know, the only way to not be implicated in the situation any longer is to withdraw the support and good that you bring to it. Yeah. And, um, the ask of that is so high. And I mean, people understood that in Gandhi's time and still understand that now, but it's also what makes him such a fascinating and intricate thinker for whom thought is so bound up with action. Mm. Um, and um, it's why we need to continue studying him and thinking about him today. Cause I, my own view is that he, he understood something about us that, that we don't often understand about ourselves mm. in that sense. Um, Faisal, this has been such an honor to speak with you. You're an incredibly subtle um, and, and original thinker. It's really been so interesting. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast and speaking with me. Always a pleasure. Uh, very nice to chat. Thank you, Faisal.